Hey, what is going on everybody? Before we start today's video, I have to just say a quick thank you to all of you. My last video received a fair amount of traction and since I have had a lot of interesting discussions with a lot of smart people, so thank you. In today's video, we will be covering multi-objective. Now this is going to be quite different from the previous videos, where this entire video will be theory and some animations, but no code. And in the next video, we will go through the code and a little more theory. Now I have been looking forward to working on this video for so long, and I hope that by the time that we get to the end of this video, you will see why. As always, we have a lot to cover, so let's dive right into it. Now at the end of the last video, I proposed a challenge question. How can we account for additional objectives when running our GA? The example that I gave was, what if as well as caring about the distance of our path, we also cared about other objectives such as fuel use? Now, fuel use is a little harder to code into our simulation than I would like, so we are going to swap this out for trip time. So we now have two things that we care about, travel distance and trip time. So let's just think about that for a second before we move on. If our car was always driving the same speed, our speed and distance would have a correlation. In other words, the time taken would always be equal to our distance divided by our speed, regardless of the path that we took. So in this case, we're effectively back to a single objective problem because adding a constant speed into the mix doesn't give us any new information. But in the real world, this isn't the case because different roads have different speed limits. So we are going to add speed limits to all of our roads. So how can we account for both distance traveled and time taken? Well, the first solution that you might have thrown out, this was also my first thought was, can't you just add trip time to travel distance and then that will give you a single value for your fitness and job done? And to that I say, uh, not really. Before I explain further, let's get some numbers up in front of us. So let's look at an extremely reduced problem where we have two towns and there's two paths between them where each path is representing a solution to our problem. As a quick reminder, our distance here is in pixels. So as to not get any hate mail sent to my house due to metric versus imperial, let's also state the speed limits of our roads in pixels per second. Awesome, so let's say for a moment that we are only considering distance. Well, in this case, it's quite simple. Path A and path B are equally good, so they would be equally fit, and in turn, they would each have a 50% chance of being selected as a parent during the breeding process. So let's repeat this process only considering trip time. Let's get the speed limits up. Excellent. So for the sake of this example, we are going to ignore all acceleration and just assume that our car is always going the speed limit. So from this, we can work out that path A takes us eight seconds and path B takes us 24 seconds. So based on time, path A is three times as good as path B. Therefore, path A would be three times as fit and would have a 75% chance of being selected as a parent, and path B would have a 25% chance. So when caring about distance, both paths are equally good, and when caring about time, path A is three times as fit. So what would you expect the fitnesses of each path to be when we take both objectives into account? Obviously path A is better, but how much better is path A compared to path B? 1.25 times, 1.5, three times? Well, let's do the math. The combined fitness from path A would be 480 pixels plus 8 seconds, so 488, and the combined fitness for path B would be 480 pixels plus 24 seconds, 504. So when we break that down into probabilities, that would mean that path A has a 50.81% chance of being selected, and path B has a 49.19% chance. So things are a lot closer than we expected. It's almost 50-50 and one of our paths takes a third of the time. Okay, 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 we can fix this. I'm sure some of you must be screaming at your screen right now. You can't just add them together. They're on completely different scales. In other words, huge changes in time taken hardly impacts the fitness at all, but having a small change in travel distance does. So, I don't know, maybe we could multiply the time taken by some factor to make it similar in scale to our distance. In our example here, we could do this by 20, which will make our longest trip time equal to our longest distance. Now that they are on the same scale, we can add them together. So now that we've done that, let's check their likelihood of being selected. Okay, so it looks like we're getting somewhere. 60% for path A and 40% for path B. So path A is 1.5 times as likely to get selected. 
But is that even correct? What are we implying when we're multiplying the time to put it on the same scale as distance? Well, we're saying that we care equally about distance traveled and time taken. Firstly, this isn't necessarily the case. We don't know which is more important. Secondly, this also means that we are voluntarily ignoring some important information about our result. Let me explain. To do this, we will modify our situation slightly and have one path that is half the length and adjust its speed limit to 15 pixels per second. So it ends up taking us twice as long. So now when we perform our scaling, both individuals are equally fit. Even though these two solutions are completely different from one another, we have no possible way to tell them apart. And it gets worse. This is just two examples, but given two objectives, there could be tens, hundreds, or thousands of solutions, all with the exact same fitness, with different trade-offs between distance and time. So clearly, using the approach of adding the two fitness values together is not going to cut it. So, what are we going to do? Well, what would be great is if we could just judge the fitness of the individuals in each objective separately. A good way to visualize this is on a graph like so, where on one axis you have your distance objective, and on the other axis you have your time objective. So, how does this help us determine if one individual is better than another? Let's add a couple more solutions onto the map and see if that helps us make sense of things. Okay, so looking at individual C first, it has a path that took it 11 seconds with a total distance of 300. So C has a better time than B, hmm, but it's worse than A. And C has a better distance than A, but again, it's worse than B. But C has no solutions that are better than it in both distance and time. So great, I guess we've just found another solution that is equally good with different trade-offs between our two objectives. So is this always going to be the case when we're using this approach to rank our individuals? Well, let's give it one more try and take a look at individual D. Well, wait a minute, C is better than D on the distance axis and C is better than D on the time axis. This means that there is no component of D that makes it better than C in any way. In other words, C is a fitter individual than D. So in GAs, we have a name for this. D is dominated by C. So we've done it. We have a way to order our individuals by fitness when we have more than one objective. But using one dominated, not dominated state really only seems to be telling us which individuals in the population are the best, but tells us nothing about the remainder. So let's see how this is applied in practice. To do that, let's get up a few more solutions. Okay, so now that we know how to, we can mark all of our non-dominated individuals. The arc that you can see these individuals forming is very common. In fact, you'll see it in almost every multi-objective problem that you have. It is called a Pareto front. Note that every individual in the Pareto front is equally fit, known as Pareto optimal, with different trade-offs between the objectives. Once we have our first front, we can temporarily remove these individuals from the equation and repeat the same process. This will give us a second front, and then we can repeat this process as many times as we need until every individual in the population has been placed into one of n fronts. So now that we have our fronts, we have a very coarse way of ordering our individuals. But once we have all of our fronts, we need some method of ordering the individual's fitness within a given front. I know, I know, I've just said that they're all equally fit. And while this is technically true, it's not practically true. So let's just grab the first front and take a look at it from an evolutionary point of view. Evolutionarily, we want to maintain as much diversity in our population as we can to stop us prematurely converging on local maximums as we've seen in the previous videos. With our existing selection techniques, we have no such method of maintaining diversity. So with this in mind, when we're looking at our first front, we have one individual that is all the way off to the far right. So it has a terrible time, but its distance is really good. Because there's no other individual that has a better total distance, we probably want to keep this individual in the population. So it should probably have a high fitness. On the other side of the spectrum, we also have an individual that is terrible on the distance axis, but is by far the best on the time axis. So this too, we probably want to keep. Then how about the remaining three individuals? Well, this one on the left is pretty isolated, so it's offering a unique trade-off that we don't get from any other individual in the front. 
So it's not quite as good as the two end individuals, but it's still pretty good. Then lastly, we get to the two individuals that are almost touching. So what does the individual on the right offer us that the individual on the left doesn't? A slightly different trade-off between fitness values? So what is it really providing to the population? Well, not much. You can also think of this another way. If all the individuals in the front had an equal chance of being selected, you would be twice as likely to pick one of these two individuals compared to any other individual. This would cause the two individuals to be selected as parents more often, which would lead our population to shift towards these individuals and would likely cause premature convergence. So clearly from this, how bunched up individuals are should have some impact on how likely they are to be selected as parents. What we have just described is known as crowding distance. For each individual in a given Pareto front, we want to check how far it is to both of its immediate neighbors. The larger the distance to the neighbors, the fitter we want this individual to be. That way, when we are performing our selection, we are more likely to pick a more diverse range of individuals and thus reducing the likelihood of our GA prematurely converging and improving how well our GA performs overall. Remember, the individuals on this front are all technically as fit as one another, so knowing that, we might as well attempt to improve the performance of our GA by intelligently ranking them. So great, we now, finally, have a method of ordering the individuals in our population by fitness. We can just order them by front ascending and then by crowding distance descending. Now this is one of many ways that we could do this, so if you can think of any other good ways to rank our individuals, please feel free to let me know in the comments below. While we now have a way of ordering our population from best to worst, this still doesn't directly translate into a single fitness value that we can use with our existing selection techniques. As a reminder, we are using two different selection techniques. The first is a binary tournament selection, where we pick two random potential parents from the population, and whichever has the higher fitness is chosen as the parent. As we still have a method of ranking our individuals from best to worst, this selection approach can still be used. Our second method is using the bias roulette wheel. As we don't have a single numerical value representing the probability of selecting an individual, it can no longer be used. Now, there are some ways that we can get around this by using a linear ranking system, which essentially provides a likelihood of being selected. But at that point, the likelihood is no longer correlated directly with the fitness, and it's really no longer a bias roulette wheel. So in this case, we are going to only use the tournament selection moving forwards. So the biggest question of all is why did we go through all of this work and what did we really gain out of it? Well, we have just gone from being able to produce a single solution for a given problem to being able to produce a huge variety of results all with different trade-offs. You can not only go to the client and say, here is your best option, but you can now go and say, I've considered all of the potential trade-offs, here's 10 options that you can pick from. They vary from most time saved to shortest distance. Isn't that incredible? Keep in mind, this is only with two objectives. This process can be extended to many more objectives, giving you additional trade-offs that would have been impossibly hard to find otherwise. Okay, so hopefully I've been able to convince you of how useful it can be to use multi-objective GAs. I hope that you've liked this theory only style of video. If you did, please let me know in the comments. If you guys like them, I will be considering doing a lot more of them as we move forwards. But for today, that is it. And the challenge question today is going to be a hard one. How does going multi-objective impact our convergence checks? Here is a small hint for you. We start out with a population like so, all spread over the solution space. And there are some individuals along the first Pareto front. However, there aren't many, and they're quite sparsely spread out. But as these individuals are chosen more often to breed, we will find more and more individuals will be approaching this line. Until at one point, almost all of our individuals will be along this front. But having the individuals along our first front doesn't necessarily mean that the solution is no longer getting better as the entire front could be moving towards the lower left, improving over time. Okay, so that is enough of a hint for now. Thank you for watching, good luck, and I will see you all in the next one.